we're moving to the fifth of the six poets we're looking at on the course. Percy Bysshe Shelley, um, as say the second generation of romantic poets. And um, I think the uh, second generation of poets, their biography matters more than the first generation in, in some ways. It seems to reflect um, the deeply political importance of their writing, and which is often overtly political, and um, does reflect to some degree a life of dissipation in the traditional sense. A lot of affairs and um, adherence to uh, anti-traditional views of a wide variety across the board. Um, I'll look at that in Shelley. Shelley's the most consistent in this, really. He's the most radical of all the, po of all the romantic poets, I think, in this, even down to the point of his verse, which lacks coherence and is um, um, allied to uh, political agenda of anarchy. So Shelley was not popular in his own day in the way that Byron was, although they were good friends and they shared much in common um, and spent considerable time together, uh, the most significant of which was probably when Mary Shelley wrote her Frankenstein. They were, three of them were together in the Villa Diodati uh, look, overlooking Lake Geneva in 1816. But um, uh, Shelley presents his poet as a figure of revolution, of himself as a revolutionary figure, not just politically, but even his thoughts and ideas and expressions. So there is no order that he, he's not presenting a new form of order to oppose the old order, he's opposed to order. And so on a, on a poetic scale, if you're looking for argumentation and coherence, the coherence is to be found in the antipathy to coherence. That's, that's the consistent point. So if you can accept that, you, you can take some enjoyment in Shelley's poetry. But if you're looking for a consistent um, argument, as it were, you're, I, you're gonna find yourself disappointed. I don't think, I don't think it's there, really. Um, so I said this biography is more important. Let me give you a few uh, details. This is the man behind me, by the way. Uh, like Byron died at a young age, even younger than Byron, and Keats, the last poet we'll look at, died even younger still. Uh, all three of them were in Italy, interestingly. And uh, there's uh, at the steps of the, the Spanish steps, they're called, in Rome, there's a Keats Shelley house there, right at the foot of the Spanish Steps where they both uh, spent time. And uh, Shelley's jawbone is there. <laughs> when he drowned off the coast of Italy and um, his uh, jawbone was recovered by a friend. It's there, sort of morbid. And, uh, and his, his heart, or perhaps another one of his organs, um, he was burnt on the beach and, uh, but his heart didn't burn up. And some question of whether it actually was his heart, if it was some sort of a calcified organ from other things, but that was sent back to England. So it's a sort of very romantic and sort of morbid. Um, but let me backtrack a little bit about that. So he, he ends by drowning uh, in a boat that he built, had built for him, which probably was not seaworthy, and he could not swim. So <laughs> rather tragic um, in that sense, uh, leaving behind a uh, um, wife who was bereft of a husband and children bereft of a father. Uh, born in 1792, so after the French Revolution had taken place in 1789. Uh, in Sussex, the son of an MP, member of parliament by the name of Timothy Shelley, so a significant figure politically, son of an MP, 
is not known. Uh, and his grandfather, from which he gets his middle name, Bish, was a wealthy landowner, uh, in fact, a baronet. So again, just like Lord Byron, we're dealing with somebody who comes from the uh, establishment and yet in his views is anti-establishment. Whereas Mr. Keats, who the last poet we'll look at, is, is a commoner and has no such aristocratic blood in him. He's not going against that. Um, so Shelley is born into privileged circles and um, studies accordingly. Uh, does his studies with a clergyman by the name of Evan Edwards. Uh, eventually in 1804, so at the age of 12, he goes to Eton College, E-T-O-N, which is the uh, establishment private school in Britain. The most private of the private schools are called public schools, which is, uh, which is confusing to Canadians because the public schools are where the public goes. In Britain, the public schools are where those who are going to um, serve in public life go. Yes, so they're pr very private, although you can get in there with, uh, with um, grants or uh, bursaries or so forth, but they're, they're where, the, where the establishment, the wealthy and, uh, and the politically connected send their children to prepare them for public service, a life of public service. In government, so many former, um, even current British prime ministers went to Eton College to this day. And the royal family tends to send their kids to Eton as well. Um, when I finished my degree at Durham, there was a possibility of me going to teach there, and I didn't want to do that particularly, but never mind. It's an interesting, I always wonder what would have happened if. Um, so he went to Eton College in, in, uh, at the age of 12, 1804 onwards, and he hated it in certain respects. I think he, he uh, flourished in his studies, but as is the practice at Eton uh, and all of the public, you know, public uh, schools, a, there's a practice within house amongst the students called fagging. And fagging has some of the connotation we associate fag these days with homosexual behavior and it's derogatory and so forth. It needn't have that, those connotations. Fagging in the, that system is simply the older boys enforcing discipline in-house. And uh, it usually involves less um, egregious things than um, what you might think. It just tends, the older boys demand that the younger boys do things like shine their shoes and hold the doors and make their tea and go sit on the toilet and warm it up for them before they sit on the toilet because it's cold, you know, all that sort of things. All, small little demeaning activities and um, and then of course it can include more um, abusive practices and, and it often does and it depends on the boys at, at, at the top of the tree and the uh, the head boy will be the, the head fag and the system's called fagging and the derogatory connotations which we associate with homosexuality are part of it but that's not all uh, C.S. Lewis talks about it in his work as well, and he, ha he hated it. Because again, it depends on the character of the head boys, and the head boys can sometimes be very good at kissing up to the establishment and be quite sadistic and brutal in-house behind closed doors. And maybe even the school establishment is aware that the boys are like that, but as long as they keep order, they don't care. So again, it, it's rife for abuse. You're putting um, a disciplinary system in the hands of, of uh, children who are may not be in a position to wield it very well, but it establishes a sort of an ethos in-house um, and, and discipline within house. But again, uh, you, you rarely read anything good about it. Um, and you hear a lot of stories of abuse from it and, and largely it's been abolished now. Um, you know, what in Canada, things that we call hazing and those sort of in, initiates, sort of in the same thing, but hazing is more of an in, introduction to the group and then you stop, whereas fagging continues. And there's a sort of a hierarchy when you get to the top, you're in the final year, then one of you will be the, the, the head, and then there'll be this sort of a chain of command type thing, and the kids coming into grade nine are terrified because they're gonna be serving in some 
capacity and they better hope that the person that's looking after them isn't abusive and is just anyway um, so he did not he, he spoke ill of that time but again it what it does is it marches marks him out as, as a privileged young man just like Lord Byron and but both of those maybe the experiences themselves there even um, colored their view of the establishment and its practices so they're very much against uh, the establishment and the association with Christianity with it because it is associated with it because officially at Eton and other colleges Christianity would be uh, required attendance at chapels daily etc and the fagging system alongside of it and where's the dissociation between the one and the other there isn't any so I think there's a lot to be answered for in that practice uh, um, on on people's perceptions there but I'll just leave that to one side um, he becomes radicalized in that period by association with a young woman by the name of Harriet uh, Grove they had a sort of quasi engagement and she introduced him to radical political ideas and he entered university colleges where it becomes slightly interesting in 1810 so now he's 18 years old he goes up to Oxford as they say you always go up to Oxford even though it's a flat place it's not you go up to Oxford and he attended University College one of the it's a collegiate system there's Oxford University you do your public lectures um, in uh, in a communal setting anyone can go to the public lectures but you're tutored in-house by you have a college tutor and and you're you're given a college residence as well and Shelley was housed at University College Oxford and he uh, met a man by the name of Thomas Hogg there classmate great friend of his and uh, also met a woman by the name of Harriet Westbrook there who became significant because uh, eventually he uh, elopes with her and marries her against the wishes of his father for which he actually is disinherited for a while she's socially beneath him his father's not pleased with the association etc etc neither is her father pleased for that matter but never mind uh, during this time I mentioned this because during that time although actually in 1811 a year after he writes a tract called the necessity of atheism and he distributes it to all the bishops in the land and the heads of all the Oxford colleges arguing a case he's an idealistic young man he says enough of this uh, Christianity is morally bankrupt uh, based on views uh, supernatural views which no reasonable person can hold in our day and the time is over for us to pay allegiance to this we're doing so out of cowardice or tradition but there's no nothing there and he expects them or hopes that they'll be persuaded by this and of course they being in their position by virtue of their allegiance to the Christian faith it's a requirement to be in those positions obviously as a bishop but even as the head of an Oxford College they boot him out he's gone out you go um, so he becomes a, a sort of Shelley University and nothing is mentioned of him he is a banished man until of course then he becomes a famous poet at which point in University College Oxford they create a memorial for him so if you walk into the college you turn to the right there's this memorial established there with a marble portrait of Shelley here uh, on a plinth quite artfully done uh, in 1893 uh, I don't think I can get a bigger picture of that that's pretty I must be able to get it somewhere else there we go that's a better picture quite beautiful there you go 
So he's, he is expelled for writing The Necessity of Atheism, but then when he becomes famous, then he becomes their celebrity uh, student posthumously. Um, someone once said to me, it's the ultimate example of Oxford hypocrisy. I can't comment on that, don't know well enough, but it certainly is rather extraordinary. Um, I will just leave that up, actually, as good as anything. Um, so booted out for the necessity of atheism, uh, this marks him as He's already anti-establishment. He elopes against his father's wishes, as I say, which is not a very good idea in this day, especially if you come from wealth and privilege, because then you risk the consequences of that. And he, did, he suffered them. <coughs> um, it would have been dishonorable to his father. His father th thought he married beneath himself, which on a uh, social level, he certainly did. Um, as I say, his father-in-law was also not best pleased that his daughter had been eloped with, but I guess at least he got married. Um, while he's there, his friend Hogg tries to seduce her, his wife, and perhaps did, unclear, um, because Shelley advocated a free love as his ideal anyway. I thought that um, uh, marriage was a patriarchal institution of oppression, etc., which sounds familiar to our contemporaries. But in, in the days in which Shelley's writing, 200 years before the present, it was radical indeed. It was extraordinarily radical. Only a few people would have held the view. Uh, but he did, and uh, spent time then in, I'd say, financial trouble for most of his life which caused him serious hardship, and also those of his wives and children. Um, but writes various uh, works in this period, uh, moves to Ireland, writes a treatise called Queen Mab, uh, which is, uh, what became famous later in its day, not um, much written about, but in the not later 19th century, is seen as a dissident tract. Let's say when he's writing this, remember this is while Napoleon's still marching around Europe. So to espouse those sort of radical anti-establishment views is a treasonous act. It would be considered that. So people would be very cautious, not want to publish it. Even if they agreed with it, they don't want the guilt by association. So even writing it is rather foolish or brave, however you want, or convicted. He's a man of his convictions. So you can either admire him or think that he's totally wrong-headed. I think you can probably do both. See something about him. Here's a man of his convictions. He's turning his back on his own privilege because he believes that there's a principle here. Um, at any rate, um, has children, a daughter named Ianthe, um, and uh, in 1814 publishes a refutation of deism as well. So even the idea of God being behind the natural order, he also finds repugnant. He will call himself in life, he will call himself openly an atheist, which is again a very brave stance to take. And uh, is going to invoke the ire of almost everybody. So even the non-Orthodox, the deists, will deplore him because they think that adherence, at least formally, to some sort of theism is necessary for morality. It's politically necessary. It's socially necessary. Let's hold on to something. Even if we don't believe in God as revealed in Scripture, we still think that the God, the principle of monotheism is important socially. And so we're going to insist that everybody do that. And we'll call that conservative values, which conservatives to this day hold on to, you know, conservative values, whatever that means. It's not Christian, by the way, but it's just a, a formal, there's, a, there's an order and a structure. And uh, in our day, a lot, there's a lot of 
noise being made about people that that is the antidote to chaos, like Jordan Peterson, like theism is good. Order is good. People flourish in orderly, structured, unified uh, environments in which we don't allow for endless diversity and chaos. It results in dis the, the chaos results in dissipation and people uh, resorting to tribalism. Things getting worse and worse. They're correct, of course. Um, but is Shelley correct in his opposition to that sort of formal commitment to a, a structure without any commitment to a belief in God beyond it. So there, here's where I'm going to play devil's advocate and be on Shelley's side just for a bit. I'm not on Shelley's side, but, but he is railing against a, 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 a sterile, orthodox, formally orthodox uh, system that has lost the marrow of Christianity. It's lost its heart. Uh, and it's the establishment, but it's not got its vitality anymore. And so his response to it, there's two ways to go. You could say, let's recover the heart of it, which tends to be the Christian response, or let's bring the whole thing down. And that's his response. Very much so. And he's consistent with it. So again, whatever you want to make of uh, right or wrong, you have to admire people who are consistent, or you think they're mad. And maybe they, they can be both. Um, so he writes a refutation, refutation, refutation of deism in 1814, and then he leaves Harriet and elopes with a young woman by the name of Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, Harriet had grown frustrated with him and they had grown apart for various reasons. You'd have to read the diaries and on both sides and so forth, but I think Shelley was probably a difficult man to live with and maybe she was as well, I don't know, but um, uh, he was moved by his, um, his desires uh, and not by his vows. And many ways. So there were, but he was consistent with his principles. He always believed in free love. He encouraged his wife to be the same as he. The wife, understandably, to my mind, was less enamored with the idea of free love because she's left with the baby as a result of it. And he can go off. That, uh, free love doesn't work well for women. Like, just ask the 60s generation. It's not, it's not a good bargain. It's bad for women. Um, men tend to love it. Uh, in Shelley's day, the men are, um, are, are subject to public discipline for doing so. They try and encourage uh, fidelity by punishing men who leave their wives behind and abandon them, etc. So Shelley had that hanging around his neck his whole life. Um, I'm with the establishment on this myself, actually. Um, at any rate, he eloped with Mary Wollstonecraft. Let me say something about this because I'm not doing Frankenstein or Mary Wollstonecraft on the course because it's romantic poetry. Uh, she was the daughter of two famous people. One of them, William Godwin, who was a radicalist 18th century pamphletist, a novelist, also um, wrote, particularly in his early days, against the institution of marriage thought it was, again, patriarchal, oppressive, etc. promoted the same sorts of political views that Percy does. And so he sees Godwin as a sort of mentor figure. He gravitates towards him, and as he does so, he notes the other, other fine-looking daughter. Yes, she's 14, <laughs> but, and yes, he's married, but she's, she's very sympathetic, she's very bright, she espouses many of the views that her father would have, and also her dead mother did. Now, her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, died in childbirth. She gave birth to Mary and then died. And Mary Wollstonecraft wrote the first, arguably the first feminist treatise, 
uh, defense of the rights of women in response to Thomas Paine's The Rights of Man. She flips it around and says the defense of the rights of women because uh, Thomas Paine advocates for emancipation and, and the vote, universal suffrage for all men. Over the age of 21, everyone should have the right to vote. You don't have to be an aristocrat. You don't have to be a landowner. Every man should have a right to vote. So it's, a, it's the French Revolution. We'll give the right a vote universally. Uh, Thomas Paine is uh, the man associated with that. Mary Shelley responds and says, how about the women? They should also have the right to vote and so forth. And talks about in, in various terms about women being um, disregarded in the whole process, etc. So she, she also is a radical. And the, and the two together uh, have Mary as their child, as I say, her, her mother dies in childbirth. But she has two famous parents and Shelley then elopes with Mary and William Godwin is not pleased with this. So free love is great as an ideal, but in practice it doesn't usually work out quite, quite so well. well. Especially when it's your daughter, right? Because his daughter is now um, connected with a man who has left one wife for a second wife, and who's to say he's not going to continue the same pattern, and also she's 14. Uh, anyway, he lopes with her, and um, uh, at the same time, um, his son from his first marriage is born after this. So Harriet bears a son, Charles, in November after he's already eloped with Mary. So Harriet is left no husband, son, no father, and he's off with Mary. Um, starts to get an income because of uh, deaths in the family. Uh, remember, he was cut off from his father's fortune, but because of, of other uh, effects, is um, starts to get some income, so he's in slightly better position, but he leaves the country, goes to Switzerland. Um, Mary has a son, um, and um, eventually marries Mary when Harriet drowns herself a year after her son is born. Um, and um, so then he marries Mary, and, and that's when in 1816 he publishes a work called Alastor, or the Spirit of Solitude, lives there with Lord Byron, writes Mont Blanc as well, um, also writes a hymn to intellectual beauty, two important poems, um, comes back to England, etc. All of this, can, you can see there's, there's a, a pattern here of um, nonconformism in all areas of life. It's not just religious nonconformism. It's social nonconformism. It's uh, ethical nonconformism. It's political nonconformism. It's poetic nonconformism. He's a nonconformist ever. He's an anarchist. He thinks that order, as it's been received, is a um, inhumane social imposition that should be removed. And he lives in accordance with that. He's a vegetarian, won't eat meat, so has sympathy for his fellow creatures, etc. So he's a committed um, vegetarian. And um, eventually has to leave England, just like Byron, because of the scandal associated with his activities, and finds uh, a, uh, a greater sympathetic reaction in Italy. Italy is not a nation by this point, by the way. That's not till 1870. The modern nation state of Italy comes about. We have a collection of duchies and, and city-states and so forth back from the Holy Roman Empire period. So it's a lot looser. You can move around relatively freely. The climate's warmer, more, it's easier. Life is sweeter. 
in, in certain respects. Um, also better for his health. He had some, just like Keats, he had some health issues, uh, some lung issues, etc. cetera. Um, but continues to write political um, treatises along with poetry. They, he, he's consistent in this throughout his life, advocating for political uh, and, um, and poetical freedom. So when we come to his poetry, you, we'll, we'll look at some of those features. I don't get into all of them. I, as I say, I'm not a huge fan of Shelley's poetry. I do think he comes up with the most uh, magnificent imagery, but it, it, um, it presents itself in a very coherent, very beautiful image. And then immediately, just like Ovid's Metamorphoses, really, it, it sort of dissipates and then another image takes its place without a logical train of consequences, just change. And that's probably because he's a materialist. And materialism is, um, is the basis of communism. So he's much admired by Marx, by the way. Uh, and other political radicals in the late 19th century. So he becomes a significant figure, not in his lifetime, but after that. Influential on a variety of very important uh, figures there. Um, I won't go over all of his works, um, but his, his, his children die often in the first year of uh, life. Very hard. On, uh, on a couple. Uh, and there's you know, signs of tension between Percy and Mary here, uh, which I think would come to any. I, don't, I, I wouldn't want to be too harsh on him for this. When you lose a child, m my experience is that m half of the marriages don't survive in our day. It's, it's a devastating loss. They can't cope with it. They blame one another. Um, one blames the other or vice versa or both, but they, they can't really cope with it. It is a grievous loss. And so he was struck like by that. Um, in 18, 18 and 1819, he writes, I think his best work, which is Prometheus Unbound, which shows his vast erudition, really. He, he was a great s student, had a good turn for languages, so studied, he would have done classics in order to go to Oxford. It, that's just a requirement. He would have had to know Greek and, and Latin. And, um, and he actually read Immanuel Kant in Latin as well, which is interesting. Read him relatively early on before he became all the rage in, in England. But read him in Latin, not in German. Um, so wrote Prometheus uh, while in Rome. His son dies, wrote the, the, the Cenci which is a sort of a closet drama. And uh, again, um, all sorts of uh, odes and on liberty and uh, falls in love with various figures and writes love poems to them and so forth. Still married to Mary, but writes love poems to, with various people, including his uh, Therese of Viviani, to whom he dedicates uh, Epipsyche. Epipsychidian, Epipsychidian, and uh, this is and his last major work, to my mind, is uh, a prose work, a defense of poetry. I think I have that on the syllabus because uh, I don't have it in the lit theory, so I thought I'll throw it in here, um, and we'll I'll comment on that then. But you'll see his rather unusual theory of poetry at this point, opposing reason to the imagination very strongly. And that really, to me, seems to be the quintessential romantic view rather than what we attribute Coleridge to. Coleridge's view is not that, but it almost sounds like it is if you listen to the critics. Uh, th they present the whole romantic movement as a revolt against reason. It's not so in Coleridge. It, it isn't. But it is in Wordsworth to some degree. And it's certainly there in the second generation, especially Shelley. So Shelley takes on significance in the late 19th century for his political views and in the late 20th century for his poetic views. 
he becomes the fashionable figure, I think, for his poetic views and in particular his um, for his sort of communist, materialist, beautiful imagery without coherence or meaning or purpose reflects the academy as much as anything. He becomes the darling of the uh, scholars that emerge in the 1960s. My doctoral supervisor, Timothy Clark, was an expert on Shelley. He wrote a really good book on Shelley. Uh, Shelley, uh, the figure of the, the poet as a figure of revolution. So the poet himself rep embodies revolution. May, I've forgotten, it's embodying revolution, the poet as something or other. I've forgotten the title. I do that, I forget all titles. But it's something about that idea that the poet himself in his, his own person reflects the revolutionary ideas and he does it everywhere and it does reflect Shelley himself. So there's a, a strong consistency here. I'll get to that when we look at his short works on life um, um, and on love. His view of love is also extraordinarily unusual, especially if we compare it to Augustine and with Christian views of love. Um, um, but we'll, co we'll, we'll come to that. But there's a great breakdown in Shelley of, and it reflects his anarchy. Oh, he writes another work called The Mask of Anarchy for that matter. So these are days when, again, in this day, while Napoleon's marching around Europe, these are unacceptable views. Nobody's gonna go near them. After Napoleon's defeated, then they start to gain a little bit of traction. And in particular, he is adopted by the Chartists and the Owenists. These are political movements, and those are largely um, movements that we would be sympathetic towards. So the, again, the, the vote for every man over 21 and the, uh, the ability to run for an MP with owning, without owning property. Um, certain general democratic principles which had not yet been applied in, in England and for the most part were eventually within a century adopted and eventually then also extended to, to women. So that, again, it's a difficult thing. Do you see, how do you see Shelley? Do you see him as, he's, he's correct in his views in certain respects, but how do we then deal with the areas where he's clearly strongly incorrect? I think, how do you assess a man like this? And um, I'm not here to assess the man, we're here to assess the poetry, but they're connected. And for him, they're strongly connected because again, he has integrity, they don't, he sort of walked the talk, as they say. Uh, comments or questions about Shelley himself? And let me come to this here. Oh, it's not gonna give me that, or will it? No, it doesn't do it. Go away. Oh my goodness. Uh, there it is. I was trying to think of what poetry I had you read. I think I only had brief, so a few short works, because I wanted to do an introduction to the poet. What did we have? Two Wordsworth. Okay, yeah, I think that's right. I know why I did that as well. Shelley. Very brief. Let's come to it in a sec, but let me s say a few words about this. I said this in general, that the second generation of poets was strongly influenced by the first. And yet, they were influenced by their early poetry and their early radical views. So there's a, an English um, critic, I think he might be retired now, Nicholas Rowe, writes a work called Wordsworth and Coleridge, The Radical Years, in which he talks about their early days and how much in their political views, they resemble Shelley and Keats and Byron for that matter. Like there's a lot of similarities there in their early days and then they become more conservative as time goes by for whatever reasons. And there are many reasons that are given for that. But um, 
The second generation was openly radical and did not depart from that, whereas the first generation, I'm not talking about Blake now because Blake was always a loony fringe guy, um, but, but Wordsworth and Coleridge eventually were the darlings of the conservative establishment. And the uh, Byron and Shelley, and to a lesser degree, Keats, regard them as turncoats for this. You failed to remain committed to the ideals which you so strongly endorsed and encouraged the rest of us to believe. And now you've turned your back on it. So that's how they regarded them as uh, men who lacked the courage of their convictions and um, saw themselves in continuity with the early writing and works and would often, you'll, you'll see the influences of Wordsworth and Coleridge in Shelley's poetry as well as Byron's as well as Keats for that matter. The later stuff not so much but the early stuff for sure. The, the stuff that we read, I didn't read later Wordsworth because it's not very good actually. His best work is his early poetry uh, and, and Coleridge stopped writing poetry by and large. So the, that, those are the, uh, the early poems are the ones that influenced the second generation. So this one is dedicated to Wordsworth. Now it's a sonnet. Sonnets of love poetry usually, but as we've probably seen already, it, it gets so widely adopted in English that it starts to deviate from that, um, its original purpose and can be used for all manner of different. So in the 17th century, you'll get run, Dunn writing his holy sonnets uh, as religious devotion, still about love, but now God and man, rather than a man and a woman. But in the 18th century, it starts to, to uh, diverge and start to be used for all sorts of secular things as well. And that's certainly the case here. But it's more of a, uh, there would be an intellectual love towards Wordsworth and a, re a revolt against what Wordsworth then became. So an expression of, of um, genuine appreciation for what he was and disgust for wh what he now is. So it is a sort of a love poem. So to Wordsworth, poet of nature, thou hast wept to know that things depart which never may return. Childhood and youth, friendship and love's first glow have fled like sweet dreams, leaving thee to mourn. These common woes I feel. One loss is mine which thou too feelst, yet I alone deplore. Thou wert as a lone star whose light did shine on some frail bark in winter's midnight roar. Thou hast, like to a rock-built refuge, stood above the blind and battling multitude. In honored poverty thy voice did weave, songs consecrate to truth and liberty. Deserting these thou leavest me to grieve, thus having been that thou shouldst cease to be." So he, he has an ideal of liberty and love uh, and uh, commitment to his ideals at any cost. It would have been true of the early Wordsworth. He had a, there were, there, there's something to be said about um, being on the outskirts in a bad time when things are corrupt. Being uh, insignificant or being on the margins is no bad thing. But now you're the darling of the establishment and you no longer talk about the things that you once did. You talk about the loss of the visionary gleam and you lost it, right? You lost the visionary gleam. And you talk about the imagination recovering it, but actually you're only recovering it imaginatively. There's no more to it than that. It's just an internalized um, ideal that has no correspondence in political reality whatsoever. And once you did, so you, you are inconsistent in your appeal to liberty. And all of these poets see themselves as heirs to John Milton. Milton, the defender of liberty, the advocate of regicide, the uh, promoter of republican government, 
the defender of free speech, the innovator of verse. So in um, his uh, grand poem, Paradise Lost, he, get, he decides, I'm not going to follow rhyme. It's a barbaric convention. I'm not going to follow it. I'm going to write that. So he's an innovator in that sense. And they see Milton as their grand hero in this sense. They see him as, a, again, a, to some degree, even though he's writing and he's in Cromwell's government, he writes while blind and defeated. And there's, there's something grand about Milton in that sense. They don't agree with his religion. Um, and they, but they do agree with many of his emphasis. And it persist, particularly, they'll say, if I were Milton, if I were writing 150 years ago, Milton's the radical. And I'm just continuing on in Milton's radical vein. Uh, and the grand march of intellect has put me in a now anti-Christian position. He would have been as well, and that's Blake's position. He's of the devil's party without knowing it. Because he was in favor of freedom, and freedom from tyranny includes the tyranny of heaven. So that's the position. Whatever you make of it, there's a consistency to it. You can see in the, in the, in the, the little sonnet here um, that he can write coherent and beautiful poetry. Like this one's very clear. Uh, actually, all the ones I'm going to look at today are, are very good. Uh, but his longer verse is pretty challenging. I'll, I'll come to that in the next class um, when we look at uh, things like, oh, no, I'm going to get to one today. OK, Mont Blanc. Yeah, all right. You're going to love Mont Blanc. Not analysis, just the poem. This is a late poem. This came to almost towards the end of his life. Um, and it is sort of a fragment. We've already talked about the fragment as a st stock poetic form of the period and a sublime one at that. Just like Tintern Abbey is a ruin, and a, a, a once finished but now dilapidated stone um, structure that the air has and rain has slowly eroded, so that you can see the signs of the power of nature as much as you can see the structure of the ruin. And so ruins are all around Gothic architecture, Romantic period. They love ruins. And the, and the fragment as a, as a poetic form reflects that same love of a ruin. And it reflects their view of their political views to some degree. We don't want a complete thing. There's a form and order. And we are, in a sense, um, consistent in our love of nature and our hostility towards form and order as a suppression of nature and its goodness. So as I say, Shelley's the most consistent in this of all the poets I can think of, really. And I don't like it one little bit. But I, I'm just pointing out the good side of it, as far as I, I can say. I know people who love Shelley. Um, I'm trying to give you my sense of the goodness of Shelley. Ozymandias. So well, I'll just read it. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. So the poem is not a fragment, but it talks about a statue that's a fragment and the sands of time that have worn away the uh, monuments to power, which themselves are 
being destroyed over the passage of time because the monuments to the power and authority are just that. They are not the power and authority, the source of power and authority themselves. And you can't hold on to the power and authority. His point's the same as Blake's, as far as I can tell. Uh, where is this here? So there's a commitment. Um, The, uh, to the fragmentation of the form as the good. And again, and it's a, in our class on the Romantics or on, um, on Burke on Wednesday, I'll get into Burke's association of the sublimity as the ideal, the more powerful, the more uh, important ideal than that of beauty. Um, cannot find this. This is not right. Yeah, get it. But you can see the political radicalism. So Ozymandias would have once been a tyrant who ruled over his people. And now the sands of time have literally worn him away so that you see nothing but the words on the plinth that describes who this figure is that we can't see. Uh, and once would have probably been used as a figure of oppression. So here's the great king, here's his statue. In marble, it will live, outlive you all. Well, it hasn't. The, the name has, but the power is gone, and the threat and the, that, and the terror that went with it has been eroded by the sands of time. And that authority was wielded through tyranny. And the tyranny will not last forever. So again, even in this poem, there is a, an attitude towards the establishment and its authority, which he sees as equally rooted in tyranny and force, which, is oppre which oppresses human nature. So the name says, look on my works, ye mighty, in despair. But we look on his works, and, he, and he's the thing that is gone. The visage is shattered. It's half sunk in the sand. It's fallen. I like the poem. It's taught in England. In, uh, in high schools. I don't think it's ever read here. Comments or thoughts about this? I'm drawing a, trying to get some coherence here. Uh, let's go to the PDF so I don't have to. Yes, I prefer these. Um, it says 1820 here. This is written in 1815, though. We published later. Uh, during the time, as I say, when he is in uh, the Villa Diodati with Mary and uh, also Lord Byron. And Mont Blanc is the grand mountain in Europe, uh, the highest mountain in Europe. Um, and is a place where the deists, those who believe they can see the presence of God in nature, like William Paley, whom we associate with the divine watchmaker. He creates the universe in accordance with certain invisible laws. He winds up the mechanism and then leaves it, but we can see his, his handiwork in the laws of nature, and even in the landscape of nature, we can see signs of his grandeur. And the mountain, Mont Blanc, which goes up into the sky to the point where it's lost in the clouds, is a visible representation of the presence of God in nature. So deists from all over make pilgrimages to Mont Blanc as if it were a cathedral. 
and they're worshiping God as it were there. They're not worshiping, they're not going into a cathedral, they're going to the cathedral, the natural cathedral, Mont Blanc. And it is a topos of, of the sublime because it's so great that you can't grasp its immensity. And if you go to, say, the Rocky Mountains and stand at the base of the Rocky Mountains and look up, it is awesome. There's a certain feeling of immensity, the same as when you look out over an ocean. It's just the vastness, and there's a little bit of terror in there as well. It's like this is uh, not a hospitable place. This is not home. The, there's a threat here, which you can imagine. And the imagina imaginative uh, part of it is an important part of it, by the way. You're imagining the grandeur, and then you are attribu attributing certain qualities to it. Um, to God, often. Burke will talk about that. So that's a sublime landscape, just like the ruin, which is a, uh, and the fragment, the destructive power of nature, which you can't see, but you can see the effect of it on human artifice and claims to grandeur like the statue of Ozymandias, which once would have bespoken uh, the domination of earthly an earthly political power who now lies collapsed into the ground. He's been overpowered by nature. Mont Blanc is a, the same sort of thing. Now when he is there in um, the Villa Diodati, I think while he's in the village he writes himself in, in, a, in a, the ledger of a hotel register something about uh, uh, being a a Democrat and an atheist and a humanist, something like that. I've forgotten now the exact description, but he calls himself an atheist again and a Democrat. Now he's writing in Switzerland, which is famous for Geneva and Calvin's Geneva, that and democratic government, not democratic government, Republican government and little and, and defense of freedom from the time of William Tell and all sorts of stuff like that. But here it's specifically dedicated to Mont Blanc, and he has in mind a poem written by Coleridge, which is also dedicated to this, but attributes it to something like uh, deist sentiments. It represents God, it represents his grandeur, his goodness, whatever. It's a very um, conventional portrait of Mont Blanc, even though uh, Coleridge is no deist. But still, he more or less gives it, and, and this is a, a response to uh, Coleridge's work. I'm not going to read it because I don't have the time, don't want to spend the time uh, doing the comparison here. But it's written in the Vale of Chamonix, so the, uh, the ice field, there's a glacier there, and reflecting on this. And you, what you can see that he does in this poem, which is five stanzas, is he vacillates from in perspectives. So it appears to be about the mountain, but as much as it is about the mountain, it's about the valley. And there's a lot of wordplay. There's rave and arve and rivulet and, and flashing around. So perspectival shifts from the vantage point, from below, from above, from here, they're all moving around. And you never know what he's talking about. As soon as you think you're, you're orientating yourself, it suddenly shifts and comes from a different direction. So there is no stable vantage point. There's no objective vantage point, which is a, a very difficult uh, if you're reading a poem for meaning and trying to say, well, how am I supposed to read this poem? Like when you're taught any form of reading, whose perspective is this? I mean, who's the narrator? Is it, is it a, if it is a narrative, is it an omniscient narrator? Is it first person? Is it third person? Like what is, the, what is the perspective that's being taken? How am I to read this? This poem will not allow you to do that. Which is, this poem's probably why I don't like Shelley. I spent so much time on it and I wanted to find a meaning, some sort of, 
And I, a, in the end, you just have to give up. No, it's, it's not there, and I will just have to accept that. But this is the point. It, it's, it's consistent in its rebellion against a point of view as authoritative, any point of view, and particularly against the idea of Mont Blanc as a representation of an ideal which represents God. He's, he's going to sort of deconstruct that. So deconstructionists love Shelley, by the way. He initiates a poetics of deconstruction in his own writing. And you can see it when he, he it's about Mont Blanc. And what does he talk about from the first line? The everlasting universe of things flows through the mind. Not what you would expect as the opening line. And rolls its rapid waves, now dark, now glittering, now reflecting gloom, now lending splendor, where from secret springs the source of human thought its tribute brings of waters with a sound but half its own, such as a feeble brook will oft assume in the wild woods among the mountains lone where waterfalls around it leap forever, where woods and winds contend and a vast river over its rocks ceaselessly bursts and raves. What you notice in this is, where's the mountain? It's there, but it's at the same time, he's not talking about the mountain. He's talking about his mind perceiving the mountain. But the poem is about his mind more than it is about the mountain. But then when it is there, there's the interaction between the subjective and, and objective, the interior and the exterior. And even the waterfalls, waterfalls, waterfalls down, but here they leap up. If you ever watch a waterfall, it actually looks, it, it sometimes looks like it's coming up because of course that when it hits the, hits the water down below, it splashes up. And so, and you can't see when it's, it, it's just going like, well, maybe it's going up. And so he likes that image because anything that will bring you to question your perspective, he wants to encourage. Where does the light come from? Does the light come from the sun? Does it come from the eye of the perceiver? It's a radically um, deconstructive poem written against the backdrop of a radically uh, sublime landscape. And so by doing, he's questioning the source of sublimity. Where does, the, where does the sublime impression come from? Does it come from God and his created order? Or does it come from our capacity to perceive God in the created order? In which case, we're the source of the divine feeling. In which case, we're divine. So what we attribute to nature is actually our own powers, which we project to reside in nature. But actually, there's nothing there. It's just a big mountain. Wordsworth will say the same thing about Mont Blanc, by the way. It's, it's his imagination which is awoken after the experience of the mountain that he rejoices in. So if you look at Prelude Book 6 and the Simplin Pass episode when he's climbing up Mont Blanc and trying to get over the top of it and he sort of gets lost and then he realizes that actually he's crossed the mountain and he didn't even know it and he's disappointed. The disappointment gives rise to the awareness that actually what was so great about the, about the mountain was what he imagined the mountain experience to be and not the reality of it. And so this gives him, gives rise to the opportunity for him to write an encomium to the imagination. It's the imagination that is the source of our sense of, of the divine in all things. It's our imagination. Shelley's also writing against Wordsworth here. He's not, it's not so much within us. Wordsworth puts it wholly within us. Shelley's not even going to, for Shelley, that would be another sort of hierarchy within the mind. He is not going to accept that 
it's here, it's there, it's everywhere. There is no center. It's, it's there in the mountain, but it's there down in the waterfall, which is actually jumping up. It's there in the light, it's there in the dark. It's glittering, it's reflecting. Where is the source of all this thing? Well, um, the source of human thought, its tribute brings of waters with a sound but half its own. Okay, so it's, there is no coherent, unified source. It's from everywhere. God is, a, he's a panentheist, again, like Wordsworth, but a more consistent one, I would say, more radical, more committed to Wordsworth's panentheism. But it, 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 to the point of, note the last word here, over its rock, ceaselessly bursts and raves, this word raves, the water associated with madness, raving mad, um, comes from the ravine of Arv. So the Arv, you know, you flip it around, rave, Arv, letters, it seems like there's a, a coherence there or a compatibility. The ravine is a dip, the river Arv, the deep ravine, lots of plays on raving, Arving. <laughs> um, anyway, thus thou ravine of Arv, Deep, dark ravine, thou many-colored, many-voiced veil, vale, over whose pines and crags and caverns sail, fast cloud shadows and sunbeam, awful scene, whose power, in likeness of the arv, comes down from the ice gulfs that gird his secret throne. Now he's thinking probably of the secret throne, Arimanes, which we just saw in, in uh, Lord Byron. So an ice uh, god, a god of frost and destruction. Inhab inhabitable to man, bursting through these dark mountains like the flame of lightning through the tempest. Thou dost lie, thy giant brood of pines around thee, clinging children of elder time in whose devotion the chainless winds still come and ever came to drink their odors. He's probably thinking of the chasuble here in a um, Catholic church where they have incense uh, on the chain. I don't know if you've seen and they but here it's a sort of a religious devotion in the, in the natural landscape here to drink their odors and their mighty swinging to hear an old and solemn harmony thine earthly rainbow stretched across the sweep of the ethereal waterfall whose veil robes some unsculptured image. The strange sleep which when the voices of the desert fail wraps all in its deep, own deep eternity. Thy caverns echoing to the arv's commotion a, lone, a loud lone sound, no other sound can tame. Thou art pervaded with that ceaseless motion. Thou art the path of that unresting sound, dizzy ravine. And when I gaze on thee, I seem as in a trance sublime and strange to muse on my own separate fantasy, my own, my human mind, which passively now renders and receives fast influencings holding an unremitting interchange with the clear universe of things around. So you'll see that he keep, where does it come from? Never lands on a position. There is no focus. There's no perceiving mind even. The mind itself is not the focus. It's not the mode of coherence. There's no co coherence in the mind. We perceive things. We create things. Where does it begin? Where does it end? Is it the chicken or the egg? He's going to say it's both all the time. Which came first? There is no first. There's no authority. There's no legitimacy. There are, it's an impossible thing to decide. If we're consistent, we will give um, credence to both positions and all positions for that matter. So he's radically chaotic. It is like Ovid's Metamorphoses in that sense. And I think there's something to be said from a similar worldview here. He is a, an atomistic poet. He is a materialist. He's a skeptic about the ideas that we attribute from material experience. At the same time, um, when I say he's a materialist, he doesn't seem to attribute much to material. He's very much idealistic in his uh, views of these things, probably in uh, ways which are somewhat disappointing to his followers. At any rate, more, uh, some think that he's most influenced by Platonism 
Earl Wasserman talks about this. Shelley is a Platonist. Anyway, um, some say that gleams of a remoter world visit the soul in sleep, like Wordsworth. That death is slumber, and that it shapes the busy thoughts outnumber of those who wake and live. I look on high. Has some unknown omnipotence unfurled the veil of life and death? Or do I lie and dream? And does the mightier world of sleep spread far around and inaccessibly its circles? For the very spirit fails, driven like a homeless cloud from steep to steep that vanishes among the viewless gales. Far, far above piercing the infinite sky, Mont Blanc appears. Still shadowy and serene. Its subject mountains, their unearthly forms, pile around it, ice and rock, broad veils between of frozen floods, unfathomable, unfathomable deeps, blue as the overhanging heaven that spread in wind, wind among the accumulated steeps, a desert peopled by the storms alone, etc. Lots of questions. Is this the scene where the old earthquake daemon taught her young ruin? Were these their toys? Lots of questions, no answers. Thou hast a voice, great mountain. Now remember the mountains associated historically with the giving of the law, the Torah, the mountain, law codes come down from the mountain. Moses, Jesus teaching um, the Sermon on the Mount, etc. Strong associations with that. Here, the mountain has no clear voice. And because of that, thou hast a voice, great mountain, to repeal large codes of fraud and woe, not understood by all, but which the wise and great and good interpret or make felt or deeply feel. So there's a continuation, inspiration from the mountain, as long as we don't attribute authority to the mountain. He's very much anti-authoritarian in every respect, except in his, the authority of his anti-authoritarianism. But never mind. I'm skipping over the fourth stanza. Mont Blanc yet gleams on high. He finally mentions Mont Blanc. The power is there, the still and solemn power of many sights and many sounds and much of life and death. So it gets more coherent as the poem goes on. It starts very in the mind, but now it's Mont Blanc. And much of life and death in the calm darkness of the moonless nights. In the lone glare of day, the snows descend upon that mountain. None beholds them there. Nor when the flakes burn in the sinking sun or the starbeams dart through them. Winds contend silently there and heap the snow with breath rapid and strong. But silently, its home, the voiceless lightning in these solitudes, keeps innocently and like vapor broods over the snow. The secret strength of things, which governs thought, and to the infinite dome of heaven is as a law inhabits thee. And what were thou, and these are the famous lines at the end, and what were thou in earth and stars and sea, if to the human mind's imaginings, silence and solitude were vacancy? So the, the concluding line is, is the most interesting because words were the tributes divine utterance in the silence. We've seen that already in the long dashes, in the pauses. There's a, uh, an appeal to some power that he draws upon, which he then projects into nature. Mont Blanc is associated by the deus with God, an expression of this, but what if the things we attribute to God are actually human powers. If your silence and the solitude I feel in the face of Mont Blanc, I say is nothing. It's just, I see nothing there at all. So it ends with a sort of a challenge to the mountain and a challenge to the law codes, and a challenge to authority, which we project and associate with authority, but actually don't have any such authority. Again, it's, in that sense, it's consistent with his broader views. Anyway, that's it for today. Next class, we will look at these 
essays on life, on love, and in the defense of poetry. Is let theory, in other words. Um, and we'll see how radical he actually is. Do you have a question? No? No? Okay, it's a stretch. 